I'm, I'm happy actually to to follow after uh, Greg's talk. Uh, and uh, mm, before corruption and indeed sex uh, became fetish words in the media and political speeches before the piled up cliches and dready phrases full of unsupported affirmations uh, regarding the rooting out of corruption or the uh, perverted bordering of various sexual practices, these two terms were used to describe phenomena integral to any form of life. Uh, false witness, rhetorical questions, and manipulative uh, hyperboles uh, are just floating signifiers, uh, and they are followed by little in the way uh, the real action should uh, protect uh, the public good. So, approximations, uh, euphemism, and uh, poor metaphors actually cause uh, the so-called active struggle against corruption and the representation of sex to repress the uh, ontological dimensions of both corruption and sex, uh, reducing them to uh, Puritan and uh, hypocritical states uh, that excludes them from the context of uh, the basic dynamics of life and death, or to use Aristotle's terms, uh, processes of coming to be and uh, passing away. So I hardly wish or dare to put into question the analysis of corruption in legal, economical, or, or even uh, colloquial meanings today, nor it is my intention to see further confusion with this presentation in an already shaken order of generally accepted values of the public cause. However, I think that uh, there can be no improvement of common life in the community, nor protection of the public sphere from personal uh, and selfish interests, unless we precisely stop willfully ignoring and rejecting the ontological status of corruption. Uh, I will connect corruption and sex uh, by referencing Aristotle and the position of the feminine. That is, not only of the woman as an individual human being, but rather everything that falls with, uh, within the complementarity and necessity of the uh, male-female uh, opposition, by which I do not mean I will either represent Aristotle or be his mouthpiece, nor will I say anything radically new from what uh, Lucie Rigaret already wrote in her doctoral thesis, uh, Speculum of the Other Woman. I will attempt uh, to adapt to the time, and I will try to select the aspects of her philosophy uh, Lucie Rigaret's philosophy, which have been neglected in favor of her epistemological, ethical, and, and uh, feminist actions. So it was the speculum, gynecological instrument, that in the 70s of the 20th century uh, began the examining of metaphysics and peering into the place that allowed the existence of the feminine, or even better, of uh, uh, that other, as a subject, for we are concerned not only within the feminine, but with anyone who is different and can be rendered subject, with the goal of improving the community of people and uh, all other living and non-living. I must repeat uh, that it is not about the individual woman, but about the becoming of subject in a metaphysics that does not tolerate anything that is not understood as one, whole, unified, and intact. Uh, the 30 years which uh, have seen gains in the right to difference for all those whose particularities have been neglected, erased, and suppressed for centuries for the benefit of the one and unified are no longer. In a perverted and revisionist way, the current struggle against the destruction of trust, bribery, and crime recommends the return to discourses of the one, the closed one, 
So uh, the 30 years which have been gains in the right to difference for all those whose particularities have been neglected, erased, and suppressed for centuries for the benefit of the one and unified are no longer in a perverted and revisionist way, the current struggle against the destruction of trust, bribery, and crime recommends to return to the discourses of the one, the closed off, uh, the exclusionary. Uh, the arguments denying the plurality of voices uh, has been revived and strengthened since the only solution is only found in conserving of unaccomplished ideal of values in the search for scapegoats and the dredging up of all damages, the newly achieved gains are annulled and fictions that allow for the return to the new beginning abound. Instead of searching for new forms of resistance to the status quo and belonging, in other words, uh, to corruption, the beginning is imagined renewed. And what if corruption cannot be rooted out? And what if its understanding, channeling, guiding were more complete if it were not exclusively tied to legally punishable, legislative, ethical, and deontological values? I will attempt to answer these questions by stringing them into one seemingly sequential line, corruption and women, as Anatole France wrote Une extrême, une extrême corruption, c'est la corruption féminine générale. The extreme corruption is actually the uh, uh, general feminine corruption. Corruption and immorality, and corruption and sex. As an illustration, uh, connection, um, moral trepidity and uh, corporal weakness, uh, tendency towards corruption and bodily indulgence, I will use Emma Bovary. Or perhaps I ought to use Flaubert, uh, who as the author either described or created the prototype of the unsatisfied, never fulfilled, or completed feminine. These uh, quotation marks complicate matters uh, and romantic nature, the tragic bimbo. Uh, corruption and sex uh, have always intimately been linked in many a suspicious and immoral practice, even uh, when the practices were based in religious and culturally established authority. For example, when sex was part and parcel of certain service and merchant games of barter and recognition, or when a sexual relation was a form of compensation where at least one of the parties involved is bribed with money. Clearly, uh, these practices uh, illustrate the age old image of women or any other sexual object as property, which immediately problematizes prostitution as well as, as, well as all other forms of measuring, estimating the value of woman or object of sexual, sexual exchange. I would, however, leave prostitution aside. I want to evoke sex in only one of its segments, when certain sexual practices weaken the soul, corrupt it, and lead it to a lustful fulfillment of corporal desire, even uh, though, on the other hand, certain other controlled and directed sexual relations encounter no resistance since they ensure genesis or generation. Only sex, it seems, allows for the soul to mingle uh, with the body. For the body is birth and decays, uh, whereas the soul is supposed to be constant and immutable, as Aristotle explains in his writing on nature. I will return to certain irregularities that appear in that uh, view after I say a few words about the understanding of cor uh, corruption as a process. Uh, differentiating the practical, poetic, and uh, theoretical sciences and further systematizing them into a specific episteme as opposed to the practical sciences, ethics, and politics. Aristotle places corruption, or Torah, which he describes coupled with generation coming to be, 
Firstly, in the domain of physics, that is, belonging to the uh, theoretical sciences. Aristotle does not define them since it seems that terms Sophia and Philosophia need not even be defined. Upon establishing the subject of physics, which belongs to the uh, contemplative knowledge, exploring the existence of becoming, and then the existence of the body, its characteristics, and after defining the nature of the principles of movement in the first book, uh, two books of physics, in the rest of the books, uh, from third to seventh, he explains movement, and more specifically, he deals with the description of changes in accordance with various categories of becoming and passing away, changing, enlargement, and diminution, as well as terms issuing from the changes, eternity, place, emptiness, and time. The last book of physics uh, leads us into metaphysics, that is book lambda of metaphysics, and the descriptions of the first immovable, beyond sensory mover of all existing. The singular and prime mover of all is thought. Andukaelo is classified after physics, uh, dealing with the ether, the eternal circular motion of celestial bodies, establishing the four sub-heavenly elements, earth, water, air, and fire, uh, and with becoming and passing away, dealt with after that. Genesis and phthora uh, are essential properties of sub-heavenly visible present bodies. Classifying the knowledge of all known cosmogonies in his age, Aristotle limits his exposition to simple bodies, homoomera, and the combinations of their becoming and passing away. These combinations are reached by mixing. Those things which contain opposites can be mixed. Since Aristotle says that it is impossible for becoming to be enjoining and breaking apart, for it is precisely through enjoining and breaking apart that corruption appears. So, and he wonders, if, uh, is there nothing which simply comes to be and passes away of its own accord, but rather always becomes from something and passes away into something? Many commentators, uh, Becker, Pantle, Tricot, Yorki, Madler, point out that the difficulty arises when Perpetuity of generation needs to be explained from the point of view of absolute non-being. For if uh, non-being were nonsensical, this difficulty would disappear. There would be neither ex nihilo generation nor ad nihilum corruption. A certain simple becoming comes from a specific non-being while everything else always comes to be and passes away through being. In other words, everything that exists had to become from contacts of proto-elements. But if it, if it came into being, it is necessary for something else to have passed away. The problem of all monist theories, uh, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Leucippus, Democritus, says Aristotle, is the assumption that there is only one form of natural movement, same for everything. Elements are not eternal and they are necessarily corruptive since they have come to be. Underpinning the complex and extraordinarily sophisticated progression of Aristotle's thesis, uh, the maintain of this cosmological construction still goes on. So it is not my goal to consider the construction in detail, uh, although I do hope to have clarified the extent uh, to which it is impossible to exclude a corruptive movement from becoming, to root it out, especially when we are dealing with the materiality of the world. Of the other relevant details connected to becoming and passing away, we certainly ought to point to the means through which the processes of becoming and passing away unfold in the, that same determined world. The general assumption is that mutual action and passivity of elements occurs, and that which is true for action and passivity is true of the movement and change. 
what can, what can be passive? Uh, that which has its form in matter. That which acts first cannot be passive. It is the cause and beginning of movement. We have said that mixing occurs when opposite meets. And Aristotle thinks that liquids are most conductive to mixing. And when speaking of matter, Aristotle describes it as a hypokaimenon, leading to the short-circuiting of the whole argument, since matter, as uh, passivity and feminine, passive and feminine, is seen in opposition to the second element of this pair, the active, hence male. It is quite well known that Aristotle got this theme of Hippocaimenon from his reading of Plato's exposition of Triton Genos in Themis, and not uh, uh, a few critics disagree with Aristotle's move to reduce the becoming of matter to that which is passive. Contemporary postmodern discourses renews Plato, uh, Plato's disinterestedness and introduces uh, Triton Genos as a methodological solution for the advancement of argumentation, but also as a place from which speaks all that cannot be systematized and is therefore deficient. Indeed, in his wish to classify and out of desire to preserve the status quo, for um, it is precisely Aristotle's recipe for the reduction of corruption uh, and uh, for, for uh, uh, arranging the political order. Aristotle leaves the premises of Genesis and Torah as feminine only. And that exclusively based on the fact that uh, the feminine as the passive and pliable uh, birthing reservoir uh, is actually on the opposite side of the male who is providing the seed, the fastest moving liquid, as a primer mover. The difficulties with the failed analogy of the seed mover and the uh, uh, reservoir in which the qualitative turns into something new, a new being, continue in Aristotle's practical writings when he analyzes corruption and the mechanisms for its delay or mitigation. These writings uh, examine ways and means in which first the individual, then the household, and finally a given political order, or the state, are protected from degeneration and decay. And uh, here is the excerpt from the fifth chapter of uh, the first book of politics. Every living thing, in the first place is composed of soul and body. Of these, the one is by nature the governor, the other the governed. Now, if we would know that what is natural, we ought to search for it uh, in those subjects in which nature appears most perfect and not in those which are corrupted. In other words, male and female. We should therefore examine into a man who is most perfectly formed, both in soul and body, in whom this is evident, for in the depraved and vicious the body seems to rule rather than the soul on account of their being corrupt and contrary to nature. Carefully noticing all the elements of a given way of governing, he continues to counsel further on how to avoid a kingdom of gen the generation into a tyranny, an aristocracy into an oligarchy, and a state into a democracy. And quite correctly points out that a tyranny is a, a monarchy where the good of one man only is the object of government, an oligarchy considers only the rich, and a democracy only the poor, but neither of them have a common good in view. This fragment alone is sufficient to show difficulties that occur with the differentiation of subjects in which nature is perfect from those in which she is corrupted. Is it possible that after so many sophisticated and careful observations about the possible explanations of natural phenomena and laws that direct men, the human world, the fact that 
all comes to be and passes away, and that along with it, you know, human becomes and perishes, Aristotle reduces his ethical and political assumptions to a primitive and inimical different differentiation between male and female. This is the question that uh, Lucie Rigaret tried to answer in her short chapter of Speculum, How to Conceive a Girl, applying, above all, a different <coughs> way of thinking and writing. I will only state that using an inverted, digressive, and associative writing style, she separates herself from the traditional metrics of philosophizing, and uh, with that act alone, she marks her difference between herself and her colleagues. On the verge of being a caricature, something not at all missed by many critics and serious analytical philosophers, in an unusual mimetic move, she literally follows Aristotle's text, phrase by phrase, as if interpreting it to herself and her readers. Each of her comments is straightforward and one needs only patience and an open mind to reach her conclusions. Uh, Irrigator begins her commentary uh, with the title itself when she leaves the word concevoir, just like in, uh, in English translation, conceive, uh, in its multiplicity of meaning, in its ambiguity. What is it about? Uh, understanding, origins, conception, or perhaps uh, imagination? In this way, who births, who creates, who understands a girl? So it becomes the ontological question by Salon. The question is uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? But the question supposes an uh, a priori. Uh, arrogance. It, it, it is impossible to ask the question of the bird, or the chicken, or the egg, unless we have the means that allow us to even ask the question. Prior to the act of birthing, says Aristotle, at the very beginning, it is taught, even before reaching the subject of thinking, before the metaphysical ascension of the subject which is again. There is the problematization of writing on becoming to be and passing away that deals with perpetuity of generation from the aspect of absolute non-being. Let me remind you, a certain simple becoming comes from a specific non-being, while everything else always comes to be and passes away through being. Then non-being is not non-sensible and generation does not have connection nor is there corruption of the human. So what is illogical in Aristotle's exposition? Uh, here is a Lucien Pérez comment. It is far from obvious that the first matter, in other words, uh, the acid feminine, enjoys this ontological privilege since her weakness is perhaps the foundation upon which the supreme elevation of God is erected. By her failure to be defined or predicated, she serves as indefinite basis for the ontological promotion of each living thing. She is both radically lacking in all power of logos and offers unawares an all powerful soil in which the logos can grow. This lack of awareness pushes deep down to the heaviest, greatest point that still centered the differentiated and circle because the admitted motive force seems to work on the outer edge of its order. Given ironic distance to the possibility that first matter as the external foundation gain ontological status, Irigaray opens up the analysis in which it becomes clear that every utterance, every statement, will thus be developed in a event by covering over the fact that being's unserverable relation to another matter has been birthed. Once being has been constituted by priori and matter has been sealed over again, as the hippocampus, the subjectum, censored out of present existence, 
that man is free to wax eloquent about the struggles he has with the killer, with Latin, and Dianus, though these fights are always already great. Somehow, the philosophical discourse forgets or denies that its subject has already been disguised and travestied by a certain speculation. And the less we see and recognize the additional part played in the physics by the mirror, the more powerful and insidious is the fiction at work. But still, Aristotle's dogma requires that the substance of the plant, like that of any female being, cannot move or move beyond the ontological statutes, the scientists, once and for all. It is not capable of any less or any more. It must remain in its individuality and its numerical unity. The meanings and directions of being are always impervious to change, you understand? Any contradiction can only be the result of not knowing this particular principle, which prohibits being from ever being defined by anything except the whole set of syllogistic premises. Finally, when we arrive at the crucial moment of determining the mechanism of coming to be a possible way, Irigaray makes an aloof remark that in her share of substance, female share of substance, not only is she secondary to men, but she may just as well not be as be. Ontological status makes her incomplete and uncompletable. She can never achieve the wholeness of her form. Or perhaps her form has to be seen, paradoxically, as a mere privation. But this question can never be decided since woman is never resolved in being, or by being, but remains the simultaneous coexistence of opposites. She is both one and the other. She is at once decayed, so hot, and growth. Genesis, for example, and this bodes ill for any resemblance she might have to the eternal. <coughs> Again, the uh, woman for Aristotle as that which must remain in its individuality and its numerical unity cannot be rendered subject. She likes the language of power which which, uh, with which she could determine her own ends. She is left to the accident of Latin, and she functions still as choice, but a choice that has always already been made by nature between the male pleasure and her role as a vehicle for procreation. This is how then Aristotle imagines the right deal for its purpose. As if matter will be controlled easier if it is given feminine characteristics, and if its entropic elements and the threat of stripping it of all purpose and pleasure connect precisely with its immediate object of desire. Passive, weak, lacking in form, and accidental, woman fits the unfitted picture of the globe in which she is but the common. Irrigary writes, but doesn't her whole existence amount to an accident, an accident of reproduction, a genetic monstrosity, for a human life takes its form only from its father, or more specifically from the male sperm, since the product of intercourse is not made up of the combination of sperm. And now, his scientific intuitions uh, not support the fact. However, despite new and proven scientific discoveries, consensus on human rights, it seems that the public opinion, as well as the structure of thought at large, particularly in times of crisis, in other words, times of intensified corruption, once again features the same traps in which our thought of. Does not the very fact that woman is the carrier and the crucial, if not the only factor, in the generative process of renewal of the species, make her the more susceptible, 
the decay of the body? We could offer an answer to this question directly through the analysis of the phenomena which made the body decay, of all the way in which we accept bodily expressions, so except all except semen, which gives life, of course, various sexual practices, as well as illness. Clearly, however, despite all that has been said, the analytic understanding of corruption is far more complete and human when compared to its Mormon conception inherited uh, as it is uh, from the normative Christian metrics of the uh, original sin. Not only that, uh, but with the modern age, women's uh, chances of avoiding stigmatization as a scapegoat of decline or corruption, it seems uh, just become negligible. Uh, again, quoting out of France, uh, une extrême corruption, c'est la corruption féminine générale. Uh, combining the pathological metaphors and the construction of the intelligible scheme of moral and political regulations, the modern discourse completely naturalizes every form of behavior that deviates uh, from the normalized and an appropriate punishment is dealt out. In the confusing mix of individual guilt and the irrepressible drive for sexual pleasure, the first to blame is woman, and along with her, all other could not fit. This does not simplify matters one bit. So I'm coming here to forbear. Uh, did Flaubert then randomly choose to make his character in Madame Bovary a village doctor who does not recognize the illness of his wife? Uh, what is Anna's illness? Uh, just once again, uh, the closing lines of Irrigate's commentary on, on seeing the girl. Admittedly, because she's deprived of everything, she also wants to take possession of everything. And that has to be granted, since anything she might thus attract to herself will be reduced to a mere reflection, shadow, fantasy, absence of what it can be in its natural wholeness, unity. Countless pages have been written about the state of Emma's so her moods and her hopeless, unarticulated motives. And it is not my intention to point out all the cliches that make this book and the character of Emma Bovary a literary classic. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, through unuttered desires, unexpressed ambitions, through unbridled fantasy, this tragic member brings her life, the life of her family, her daughter's life, into a completely disregard. And I would like to illustrate the invisible line of irreducible corruption now. I do not know if uh, Flaubert uh, has this in mind when writing the book, although known as a perfectionist and seeker of the more just, just not, just the and I leave it entirely in prison. I myself, however, do not help but notice the sequence of elements of corruption that travel from one modality of behavior to another, imitating precisely Aristotle's claim that everything comes to be in a process of way that always fully especially when this motive is in connection with feminine behavior. In the same way, corruption as the floating signifier leads Emma uh, unconsciously but literally by the hand from one hand to another. In each, she awakens a different behavior, and for each, she represents an entirely specific time in life. Uh, I had no intention of drawing any patterns of generalization, even as the coincidence. Uh, Corruption so directed in Flaubert's book is certainly a, a result of his genius. The 
Now, uh, in order to keep uh, this paper short, I will only uh, quote the English translation of uh, uh, Madame Bovary. And I assure you that uh, the original two constantly use uh, corruption, the word corruption. Uh, so, briefly, Madame Bovary begins and ends with uh, Charles Bovary, uh, the husband of Anna Bovary. At the very beginning, Faber uh, sketches the uh, everyday life of this village doctor who spends his uh, time in a little town in Normandy. After the short remarks about him, his family origin, and the circumstances in which he meets his second wife, uh, the book begins to focus on Emma. Following the descending line in Emma's behavior, Charles uh, decides to move to a slightly larger town for the sake of his wife. Uh, despite her brief excitement at having birth had bad, uh, the daughter melancholy returns to Emma. Her words changes when she meets Leon Dupuis, the first intelligent young man who seems to share with her a taste for the finer things in life. Uh, she fears for her virtue and uh, actually hides her uh, feelings from him. Uh, playing a beautiful wife, uh, exasperated by Emma's names, Leon leaves uh, Paris where he continues uh, his studies. At the same time, Charles takes uh, care of the servant of a rich rentier, Rodolphe Boulanger, who upon meeting Emma decides to seduce her. His plan works and Emma becomes uh, his lover, venturing into romantic fantasies that slowly draw her doom. And now is a citation from Flaubert. But with that superior critical judgment that belongs to him, we no matter what circumstances holds back, Rodolphe so unrealized to be got out of his life. He thought of all modesty in a way. He treated her quite sans façon. He made of her something supple and corrupt. Hers was an idiotic sort of attachment, full of admiration for him, of a voluptuousness for her, the attitude that benumbed her, her soul sank into this drunkness, shrilled up, drunk it like Clarence in his life of Nancy. Four years upon uh, awakening her, something subtle and corrupt, Rodolphe cruelly discards Emma with a letter he sent her at the bottom of a basket full of Africans. Upon hearing the news, Emma falls ill, and Charles is once again tasked with caring for her and finding a cure. Immediately before recovering completely, Emma and Charles go to Rouen to the opera, and by chance they encounter Léon, uh, pretending to be taking piano lessons. Uh, Emma uh, is visiting uh, Léon in Rouen, and uh, she spends her time with her newly become lover. Now again, Flaubert, he did not question her ideas. He accepted all her tastes. He was rather becoming her mistress than she his. She had tender words and kisses that thrilled his soul. Where could she have learned this corruption almost incorporeal in the strength of its profanity and dissimulation. Obviously, the address of giving into corporal desires this time leads Emma into ecstatic access. So there was, he was rather becoming her mistress than she his. Il devenait sa maîtresse plutôt qu'elle n'était la sienne. Strange uh, syntax illustrating Emma's ambivalence, but also an indecidable game of, of sexual difference. At the apparent peak of powers, beginning completely to last for the untold time, 
and manipulates Shaw's good intentions and uh, sinking the debt. The creditor and the usual lover haunts her, and when she desperately seeks help uh, from her former lover, uh, he rejects her brutally, Emma takes arsenic and dies in agony. And now it's um, Shaw's turn to become corrupted. To please her as